Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video today on the channel. We have Institute of Human Anatomy. This is a very, very, very popular channel, 8 million subscribers, and the title of the video is What Sugar Actually Does to the Body. Now, just because someone is more trained in human anatomy as opposed to any other topic like biochemistry or anything like that does not necessarily mean that they cannot talk about the effects of molecules on the body. In fact, many people, I would venture to guess, that understand human anatomy probably understand biochemistry chemistry to some extent, maybe, maybe not. So it wouldn't surprise me if they do. But I just found it interesting that a human anatomy profile on YouTube and channel would be talking about this. But they do quite a few things like that once in a while. So we're just going to go ahead and jump right into the... Oh, I'm, I'm, right now I'm looking into the description and it says go to athleticgreens.com slash human anatomy to get started on your purchase. So, okay, so they, 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 don't, um, they don't fully understand nutrition. But anyway, yeah, we're just going to jump directly into this and see what they have to say. 17 minutes and 50 seconds, we'll try and get through it as fast as possible. But before we get started, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. And also, if you haven't bought my book Contraindicated already, please go ahead and do so. Link in the description below. And now, let's jump into the video. Have you ever been told that sugar is bad and that you should stop eating it? Well, usually I'm the one that says that, actually. But yes, I was told that ever since I was a little kid. Rightfully so, actually. I was told a lot of things whenever I was a kid, though, as well. Like, you should stay away from fat. As if, first of all, that all fat is the same. And also, as if there aren't essential fatty acids and essential amino acids, but no essential exogenous carbohydrates. So, anyway. Probably. But then you may have wondered, why is it bad? And if it is... Well, it's bad for a few reasons, and I'm gonna save it until we actually get into the nitty-gritty details in this video. How bad are we talking here? pretty bad. Like, a little bad and I can still eat my cookies, or... Mm, well, people can do whatever they want to do. They can choose whatever they want to do. And also, little is a value judgment statement, so really it's a subjective opinion. But that's why we use words on this channel like indicated and contraindicated. Plug. Go buy. Today. A lot of bad and I should stop eating it immediately. Well, mm, probably that, actually. Definitely that. But again, that's a subjective opinion. Once again, if we're really going to be accurate, it's going to be indicated or contraindicated. Well, in today's video, we're going to answer these questions, as well as talk about how the body processes sugar, what sugar actually is, and even talk about how exercise can change how we utilize and process this sugar. Correct. This is going to be full of all sorts of sugary anatomical awesomeness, so let's do this. Well, the thing about sugar consumption and its effects and ramifications on human health, that more so has to do with biochemistry, not human anatomy. So first, what do we even mean when we use the word sugar? Okay, well, whenever we say sugar, what we mean are basically the family of suffixed with oses, basically. You've got dextrose, you've got glucose, you've got fructose, you've got sucrose, you've got lactose, you've got galactose, you've got all of these different sugars. Maltose is another one. Really, what the prototypical sugar is, is glucose, the one that the body produces on its own. It also produces fructose, which is an isomer, but it does it from glucose. It it is a 6-carbon aldohexose, basically, and it is a molecule that is essential for human life. If your body did not have glucose ushering, or rushing, not ushering, rushing through our veins right now to some degree, we would be dead. Astrocytes, which are some of the nerve cells in the brain, actually depend on glucose. The other neurons actually do not depend on glucose. They can subsist off of ketones for the rest of their lives, actually. Muscle cells right now, by the very manner of me sitting upright in this chair and talking and moving my hands, there are various muscle fibers twitching right now that are utilizing a process called glycogenolysis in order to produce ATP well quickly enough to perform a muscle twitch, irrespective of what the mitochondria are using in those muscle cells. Glycogenolysis is a non-oxidative process. So anyway, yes, my, my muscle cells are using fat and glucose at the same time right now. But the problem is that all sugars, whether it be glucose or sucrose, which is a disaccharide as well as lactose and disaccharide between two monosaccharides. The problem with those sugars is that above a certain physiological concentration within the bloodstream, they do absolutely wreak havoc on the body via a process called glycation, and they produce a lot of advanced glycation end products as well as a result of that. So, the most conducive way to basically curtailing that damage that one would incur and does incur and sustain from consuming excessive amounts of carbohydrates is to not consume excess. What is excess? Well, that's actually any gram above absolute zero, any amount above absolute zero, because 
carbohydrates are not required for human consumption and are therefore contraindicated because, once again, above a physiological concentration within the bloodstream, they will induce damage. So that is what we were talking about when we talk about sugar. Sugar is basically all carbohydrates, all of them, besides fiber, because fiber is not broken down the same way. Fiber is also a contraindication, but for other reasons. So that is what we're talking about when we talk about fi uh, sugar, not fiber, sugar. Most of us are referring to table sugar. Okay, so sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide between two monosaccharides. A disaccharide is a combination of 50-50 exactly, one monosaccharide and another. In this case, fructose and glucose. Fructose is seven to 10 times more glycating than that of glucose, and it's also completely inconspicuous in terms of the damage that it induces because it is not registered on an HbA1c test. So that sucks. And this can sometimes be associated with some negative connotations. Well, rightfully so, because table sugar is contraindicated. It also has no nutritional value at all, just as a bonus there. There's nothing in it. Maybe you've heard things like sugar is bad for you. Well, because again, it's contraindicated. Above a certain physiological concentration within the bloodstream, it is absolutely deleterious. Fact. What is diabetes? As is weight gain. It's associated. Uh, well, it is conducive to effectuating weight gain, absolutely, in the form of fat and also water. Water weight goes up usually commensurate with the amount of inflammation that you're sustaining, and inflammation is a pre-programmed response that occurs within the body when it has perceived damage to tissues or a potential invading pathogen, both of which are activated by glucose, actually through the same mechanism. Damage to tissues, like I've just elucidated, it destroys lipid rafts, tears cell membranes to pieces, binds to DNA, and causes mutations to it actively, and in high enough concentration within a cell will absolutely kill it outright. So damage to tissues, there you go. So it activates damp receptors on cells, damage associated molecular patterns. And also it makes the body think there's an invading pathogen because it deranges proteins, which makes those proteins be viewed as foreign proteins by the body. In reality, the body probably doesn't perceive it to be foreign or there's no pressure on the genome to basically launch an inflammatory attack or response on those cells because of it being potentially pathogenic. It's more likely to do with the fact that deranged proteins can cause issues by functioning as a wrench being thrown into a system. So either way though, potential invading pathogen and damage, glucose causes, but also in terms of fat gain. So, th so that's how it, it can cause excess water weight, right? By gap junctions, basically widening to allow for fluid to enter cytokines and all that stuff but associated with that is water, but also fat gain, because what is the primary hormone that regulates fat storage and creation, by the way, from glucose? Oh yeah, insulin. And what stimulates insulin? Well, insulin is released according to potassium and calcium channel fluctuations. And the most powerful stimulus to change that fluctuation rate or activity is ATP or well, glucose mediated ATP production within beta cells on the islets of Langerhorn of the pancreas. Let's continue. It's associated with diabetes. It it's the cause of diabetes. Diabetes. diabetes is a disease, type 2 diabetes. Well, all diabetes is a disease characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. It is defined and measured as such. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes, well, those are different in terms of the etiology behind them. Type 2 diabetes is invariably, truly pathological type 2 diabetes is 100% unequivocally, unambiguously, necessarily caused by carbohydrate consumption. To some degree of carbohydrate consumption, there are things that you can consume that can and do lower the threshold that one would have to attain or surpass in order to develop diabetes, usually because of the fact that they cause inflammation, such as seed oils, such as deuterium, such as plants. But in order to genuinely develop type 2 diabetes that is pathological, there's a reason that I'm adding that emphasis there, because a lot of people think that just having an increased fasting blood glucose level when you're not consuming carbohydrates is somehow deleterious, despite the fact that if you do a fructosamine assay on those people, a lot of times it comes back stone cold, which means that there's no actual glycation damage occurring. You have to be consuming carbohydrates to some degree. Okay? Okay can cause inflammation and it can and does actually above a certain physiological concentration within the bloodstream. Next. The list goes on and on. But are these accurate or even fair assessments of sugar? Absolutely, 100%, yes. And could there ever be potential situations where sugar might be beneficial? Well, yes, sugar is essential for human life. What we need to do is distinguish between exogenous glucose or exogenous sugar and endogenously created glucose. Endogenously created glucose is always invariably necessary to be created because the creation of that glucose is dependent on your genes. It's encoded for by your genes. Those genes having evolved for billions of years. Anyway, 
Because in biology, the term sugar is used to refer to certain types of carbohydrates. Yes, and carbohydrates, exogenously speaking, are all contraindicated for human consumption. I mean, really think about this. Why are they the only macronutrient that isn't genuinely a macronutrient? What do I mean by that? They're not required for human consumption. None. There are essential fatty acids and there are essential amino acids. There are no essential exogenous carbohydrates. Think about that for a second. And we're told that carbohydrates should be our primary fuel source. Wow. And what you might find interesting is that as we talk about sugar, we're gonna find that the same types of carbohydrates that are found in table sugar are the same carbohydrates that are found in fruits, vegetables, and other whole food sources that we typically consider as good for us. Right, they're typically considered that, and fallaciously and erroneously so. They are the exact same molecules found across the board. Fruit, like an apple that is on the screen. Well, that contains fructose, sucrose, and glucose, and maltose, and sorbitol, which is a sugar alcohol that basically, when present in high enough concentrations within the bloodstream, since it has an osmotic force, will cause your cells to burst. Some cells being more prone to experiencing that than others, those being the cells in the retina, or the retinas, the kidneys, and the nerves. The very cells that tend to go to sh first in diabetics. Diabetic retinopathy, diabetic nephropathy, diabetic neuropathy, anyway. So we definitely need to go a little bit deeper into this sugar discussion. And no, we don't. You just covered it. Plants and fruit and, and vegetables and all that stuff, they're contraindicated for human consumption. They're not required. They have an exorbitant level of anti-nutrients within them that inhibit nutrient absorption, but also actively cause harm. If you go into the woods right now and you find a bush of berries, would you eat that bush of berries? The answer should be no, and I really hope it is. Why is that the case? Because plants are toxic. We just made the erroneous assumption at some point in our recent history that just because a plant doesn't kill us immediately upon consumption, some of them, after human hybridization, by the way, to make that so, that somehow they're safe for human consumption and they're indicated. And now in very recent history, like within the last two decades, we've been told that plants are actually healthier than meat and animal products. That's a whole other issue. Let's start with the term carbohydrate. Let's start with that. Carbohydrates are compounds that are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Correct. And cyanide is made up of similar things. Just because molecules are made up of simple things that in isolation aren't harmful to us doesn't mean that whenever you combine them together that they're not harmful. And that's not what you insinuated and implied necessarily, but I just want to make sure that we get that right. So yes, oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. By the way, oxygen being something that actually does harm us. So, you know, just very slowly. It's, it's a way in which our body rusts and ages. You can't prevent reactive oxidases oxidative species. You can curtail the production of them and curtail the damage that they induce to the greatest extent possible, and that's why the body creates a suite of antioxidants that it produces endogenously, like glutathione and uric acid, a powerful water-based antioxidant. And also, it doesn't hurt to ground electrically to the earth because you will be, well, absorbing electrons from the grounded platform, such as the literal earth, which function as antioxidants, considering the fact that oxidation is the loss of electrons. So if you gain them, then it's an antioxidant. Anyway. And they include things like sugars, starches, and even cellulose. Yes. Cellulose is metabolized differently, though. You don't absorb it, and you don't break it down. And last I checked, if you can't digest something, you shouldn't be eating it. But anyway. Now, cellulose, we're not going to talk a lot about because this is something our body can't break down. and absorb. Okay, exactly. Yes, correct. Absorb, and it is one of the contributors to the fiber in your diet. So it Yes, it is the primary fiber in the diet, besides the soluble fiber, which is something else and is more conducive, actually, to stripping nutrients from you. It prevents you from absorbing nutrients. It helps push things along in your large intestines. No, it doesn't. It actually is more conducive to blocking the large intestine, okay? There's only been one study that was ever published in order to actually attempt to establish fibers evidence efficacy to ameliorate constipation that was even remotely scientific because it was the only study that even remotely attempted to control for confounding variables, which it didn't do because the science cannot do that under any circumstances. And it was published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology in 2012. And it showed that, I don't know, about 71 people, maybe, maybe even less than that, that presented with idiopathic constipation were basically split up into three groups. And one group was told to perpetuate their fiber intake. The other group was told to slightly eliminate it, whatever the hell that means. And the last group was told to completely eliminate eliminate it, and the only group that actually showed a complete amelioration of all of their symptoms of constipation was the group that abstained from fiber and at least reported to have eliminated fiber from their diet. And it was every single person in that group, invariably. That's what that means. 41 people, I believe. Tough to ignore. But you can have epically amazing bowel movements. No. <laughs> It's actually conducive to not allowing that to occur. It's conducive to causing issues, okay? But sugars and starches 
We can definitely break down and absorb into the bloodstream through the small intestine. Very quickly, actually, especially if you don't combine it with fat. And if you combine it with fat, it's actually still worse, though, because even though you don't have a spike in blood glucose, well, the increase in glucose actually lasts longer. And you require more insulin, even by type 1 diabetics that were told to consume a mixed meal compared to one that had very little fat in it. 42% more insulin was injected over the course of the entire 24-hour period. Interesting. Randall cycle, anybody? Perhaps it has something to do with it? Hmm and we typically use these as energy sources. And well, correct. People do typically do that. Should they be using glucose as an energy source, energy being something the mitochondria create, therefore, should we be oxidizing glucose primarily? No, we should be using glucose non-oxidatively like I'm doing in my muscles right here. If it's used non-oxidatively, it doesn't create energy. It creates ATP, which is a cellular energy currency. It is not energy. It is mass, those two being different. Interconvertible on a technical basis, but not in everyday life, so. So again, sugars and starches fall under this umbrella of carbohydrates, but what are some of the differences? Now, the term sugar is referring to simple carbohydrates. You may No, it's referring to carbohydrates. Fiber is excluded for good reason, fine, but it's referring to carbohydrates, complex or otherwise, because there's many complex carbohydrates that we consume that are not fibrous. You've heard of the phrase simple sugars before. Now, these are smaller carbohydrate molecules, which includes things that are called disaccharides, and monosaccharides. Yes, the monosaccharides are just the single molecules, glucose, fructose, and galactose. And then, like I said, disaccharides, sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Sucrose is glucose and fructose. Lactose is glucose and galactose. And maltose is glucose and glucose combined together by, what is it, alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds? That's how they're attached. I know that because glycogen is like that, basically. They use alpha-1-6 and alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds. Saccharide just means sugar, di means two, mono means one, and so a disaccharide is made up of two monosaccharides. Correct. Now, even though we're using some of these jargony biology terms, you have likely heard of disaccharides and monosaccharides that are found in the foods you eat. For example, lactose is the disaccharide found in milk products. And of course, sucrose is the disaccharide that makes up table sugar. And since we're really kind of focusing in on this table sugar, this table sugar, AKA sucrose is made up of one monosaccharide called glucose bonded to another monosaccharide called fructose. So glucose plus fructose equals sucrose, which is table sugar. So if we kind of take a step Deja vu. back, imagine yourself holding a spoonful of sugar. And that spoonful of sugar is made up of multiple, multiple molecules of sucrose and therefore the building blocks of glucose and fructose. And you're about to eat it, but of course, you're an inquisitive mind about biology, anatomy, and physiology, and you're thinking to yourself, what is it about this table sugar, and therefore the fructose and glucose that's found in this, that makes it worse than the glucose or fructose that I find just in the fruits and vegetables and other food sources? Nothing. They're both equally as damaging and deleterious and shouldn't be consumed. In fact, fruit is arguably even worse because it has more fructose comparatively to glucose and a lot of sucrose as well, which is why fructose is known as the fruit sugar. And also it has a bunch of fiber and deuterium in it. Fiber being something that is abrasive to the enteric lining, something that we cannot digest. And depending on the fiber, something that we ferment, so still not digestion, which can cause issues as well. Like, I don't know, once again, inhibiting nutrient uptake from the other associated foods in the meal that you just consumed. And deuterium slowing the rate at which you're mitochondria function via affecting the proton pumping activity of mitochondria, which also doesn't occur. By the way, proton pumping implies that hydrogen ions are independent variables and that you can change the pH of a solution by putting hydrogen in it, which is false. Well, to answer that, I think we need to talk a little bit about the starches. Starches are complex. Starches are only broken down into glucose and not fructose, which makes them, I guess you could say, far more innocuous, except they're still not innocuous whatsoever because glucose is still harmful above a certain physiological concentration within the bloodstream evinced by, I don't know, the existence of diabetes. It's carbohydrates, which are polysaccharides. And the starches that humans ingest the most are amylose and amylopectin. And these are multiple interesting glucose molecules strung together or bonded together. Or you could think of them as these long chains of glucose, hence they are referred to as polysaccharides. Now, we can definitely compare and contrast these to the disaccharides or the table sugar. As we can see, yes, they both do contain glucose, but there's a huge difference in the size of, say, table sugar versus the size of the molecules that make up the starches. And this is where you start to see some discuss a negative potential effect of the table sugar. And that has to do with how it's broken down and absorbed into the body when you compare it to the starches. So we need to talk about what happens when you put the table sugar in your mouth versus what happens when you put the starch in your mouth. 
basically the same exact things occur, perhaps to a faster or a slower degree. I think we're probably talking about trivial time differences, though. You combine it with fiber, you can slow the spike even more, except you're just consuming another contraindication on top of the previous one. Contraindicated. Not advised as a course of treatment or procedure. Now, since we are talking about putting things in our mouth, we should probably talk about ingesting an amazing substance from the sponsor of today's video, Athletic Greens. It's not an amazing substance. Look at that, guys. See that? These people should probably stick with anatomy because that's what they know. Athletic Greens is a nutrition company that makes an amazing nutritional drink called AG1. No, it's not an amazing nutritional drink and it's actually anti-nutritional. Look into oxalic acid and phytic acid. AG1 is made from 75 different ingredients and includes vitamins. Well, that's a problem. Is that appealing to people? Vitamins, minerals, Probiotics, super... Well, there's vitamins and minerals and meat. Probiotics, well, the gut microbiome will cultivate bacteria according to the diet that one consumes and completely benignly as well, as long as someone transitions to a diet appropriately and prudently, if we're talking about in the context of someone that is transitioning to a diet. Foods and adaptogens. I've been taking... Well, what's the dietary requirement for adaptogens in the human diet? I've been taking AG1 for almost a year now, and one of the things I really... Well, who cares? ...like about it is how convenient it is. I hate... Well, you know what else is convenient is eating meat. And you know what else is convenient is not having to eat every single few hours. Opening multiple pill bottles. And so when I take AG1... I'll... Well, why are you supplementing with anything if you're getting everything from your diet? If your diet is truly indicated, then you should be taking effectively zero supplements. We do live in a modern world nowadays, so you can make the argument that, well, our food isn't as nutritionally replete as it used to be before. Except in the case of carnivore, it actually still is. Because animals still have all of their structures intact, and so we get all the nutrients we need from them still. You can make the argument about electrolytes, maybe, but guess what? We have salt, and I wouldn't really consider salt a supplement. All I have to do is get one scoop, dump it in eight ounces of water, shake it up, and I'm good to go. And one of the things I'm constantly trying to do is enhance my performance during sports and races, as well as to enhance- Well, the best way to do that is actually to transition appropriately and prudently to a species-appropriate, species-specific diet over the course of six to eight weeks. That can help. Enhance my recovery time and make that more efficient. AG1 includes ingredients that can help support this as well as help support- No, no. If you want your vitamins and minerals, get it from meat and eggs and fat. Energy levels throughout the day. And that's a plus for me because I'm not a big coffee or caffeine drinker. AG1 well, is all- You shouldn't be. Really? The only way to get energy is, is, is from taking a stimulant? Is that what we've come to as a society? It's so normal to just be drained of energy that we think that in order to actually have it, we need to take a drug. Also NSF certified, so you can be assured what's on the label is actually found in the product. If you're interested in including AG1 as part of your daily routine, go to athleticgreens.com slash human anatomy, and they'll give our viewers a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D, as well as five free travel packets. Go in the sun. We'll also include that link in the description below. So back to the ingesting of sugars and starches, and this is- Right, the contraindication that plagues our entire society today. Good. Discussion around how bad is sugar. It's pretty damn bad, but let's get into it. So once we place the sugar and starches into our mouths, what we refer to as the oral cavity in anatomy, this is where the process of digestion begins, through chewing and through the secretion of saliva, which contains certain enzymes to help start this digestive process. We then move this down the esophagus and into the stomach where the sugars and starches will mix with the acid through the smooth muscle contraction. Not acid. There's no acid in the stomach because the entire concentration of hydrochloric acid in the stomach at all times is necessarily zero. Let me get to a point that really, really needs to be addressed here. Sugar molecules, even complex carbohydrates, especially complex carbohydrates, are broken down by the enzymes of the saliva into simple sugars immediately before you even swallow it. So now I'm gonna chew this. So there's an enzyme in our saliva and its job is only to break chains of starch and turn it into pure glucose. So this complex carb there's nothing complex about it it's becoming pure glucose pure sugar in my mouth before it even gets to my stomach there we go loading see that 370 pure glucose he, he, he seemed to not really explain that and then it enters the stomach fluid not acid it's an acidic solution and the hydrogen or really the hydronium in the solution will start to break apart the proteins and all that stuff along with other enzymes that are secreted by the pancreas like pancreatic lipase anyway the sugar molecules are broken down in the mouth first actually the stomach acidity the stomach fluid has very little to do with the breaking down of, of starches into sugar so the stomach and this mixture will eventually make it to the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. Now, duodenum. Yeah, um, and that's whenever you'll start to get the influx into the bloodstream. The duodenum contains specific enzymes that can break down specific types of carbohydrates. For example, sucrase 
will break down sucrose, the table sugar, into the individual glucose and fructose molecules that we talked about earlier. Amylase. I didn't know the specific enzyme. There we go. Look at that. I'm learning something. Amylase is a specific enzyme. Amylase. Yes, yes. That's actually, we, we have that in our saliva. To breaking down amylose. So that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. Right there. Saliva. What's important to understand is that our bodies can only absorb the monosaccharides, meaning the individual glucose and fructose molecules. So you can see that this breakdown and digestive process is important for the absorption. And as those glucose and fructose molecules move further down the small intestine, as they've been freed through the digestive process, they'll move into the jejunum and the ileum, second and third part of the small intestine, and then be absorbed through the wall and into the bloodstream. And once those glucose and fructose molecules are in the bloodstream, the first- They will start to wreak havoc on the proteins in the body above really a concentration of about four grams systemically, one teaspoon. And we're talking about one teaspoon of glucose that's in the bloodstream because fructose is not supposed to be in the bloodstream to any significant degree whatsoever. The first place that they will go is to the liver. Now the liver does a lot of different things, but one of the first things it will do is convert- now, Hold on a minute, hold on a minute. It goes to the liver first? No, not necessarily. If the body actually requires that sugar, why, why, why would the sugar immediately go to the liver? That's a good question to ask here. Why would it immediately go to the liver, sir? I don't know his name. Because if the body actually required that sugar for oxidative purposes, it would sequester it at the behest of insulin. So really it wouldn't sequester it, it would be administered by insulin through GLUT4 transporters that would actually be recruited to the membrane by AMP kinase because the cell needs the energy. This is particularly in the context of muscle cells because fat cells, well, same thing a little bit, but sort of different. But anyway, yeah, basically what happens is glucose stimulates a vast increase in insulin, not fructose, glucose does, via the GLUT2 transporters on pancreatic beta cells. And the insulin functions as the facilitator of, of glucose administration in a cell if it actually requires the energy at that time. That's a key important detail there. And it also is responsible for taking excess glucose and converting it into fatty acids at the level of a Adipocytes, fat cells, directly, or the liver. Basically, what I'm saying is it's only taking the liver if it's in excess. And what happens to what happens to glucose at the liver? It's converted into fat. Most often, the liver has some capacity to oxidize that glucose itself, but liver is not really responsible for, it's, it's not really involved in glucose oxidation. It's involved in fatty acid oxidation, ketone production, and glucose production, and fat production as well. So anyway. Those fructose molecules into glucose molecules. So we don't have all this fructose. Yes, yes, yes. There is some degree of the small intestine that can actually take fructose and metabolize it first before it even enters the bloodstream. It's a small amount and they will use it for energy production at their own localized areas. But as soon as it's in the bloodstream, it goes to the liver. It's converted to fat at the liver effectively. Also look into fructose metabolism and uric acid, which exists at physiological pH as urate. And then look into AMP and all that stuff and, and ammonia and all that stuff. Cause it's, it's not good stuff what fructose does to cells. Circulating throughout the body. And when you think about that from a clinical setting, when we measure, say, like blood sugar levels, we're measuring blood glucose levels as glucose. Exactly. Nothing else. Because the HbA1c test does not pick up on fructation. Not even a fructosamine assay, even though it seems like it's in the name, doesn't pick up on that. This is this primary monosaccharide that's circulating throughout our body. But I did graze over something kind of quickly there. And that was the breakdown and the absorption rate of say like a sugar versus the breakdown and absorption rate of a starch. And remember- So the same thing. We mentioned that sugars- Not the exact same thing. That's not what I mean. They break down to the same thing. Are relatively small carbohydrate molecules, the disaccharides, especially when we compare them to the complex carbohydrates, polysaccharides. And because of this difference, the sugars, the disaccharides, tend to be broken down and absorbed much more quickly. So blood sugar levels will rise more rapidly, but they'll also taper off or go down more rapidly. Yeah, because of the vast and actually excessive release of insulin from the pancreas, which will lead to a hypoglycemic state afterwards, postprandially, quickly, yeah. As compared to say, like a complex carbohydrate where that breakdown or that digestion is more slow, so the blood sugar levels tend to rise more slowly, but they also tend to be sustained for a longer period of time. And this is one of the negative things you can think of or that's sometimes mentioned about sugar is that the blood sugar levels could spike, but then also kind of crash down. And it does, okay? But even if it doesn't spike and it rises above a physiological concentration within the bloodstream, it will still be inducing damage and be conducive to storing fat, inhibiting lipolysis. That's according to the ITG ratio, insulin to glucagon ratio, and well, inhibiting ketogenesis to some degree as well. It's just not a good thing. It's conducive to causing inflammation, all that stuff, all that great, great stuff. Now you can combat that in some situations. If you only ate a simple sugar, you'd kind of deal with that spike and crash. 
But if you paired that simple sugar, say with a complex sugar or a complex carbohydrate, yes, the blood sugar levels would increase relatively rapidly, but then you'd get that. So what? Sustained blood sugar level because you'd have that complex carbohydrate following behind. Okay, so still a bad thing. Still everything that's bad. So are you even gonna talk about glycation at all here? Now, there are certain situations where I want a simple sugar or a sugar to get in there and raise the blood sugar levels quickly. Why? What are the contexts that you're speaking about? Are you talking about hypoglycemia? Extreme hypoglycemia? That would really only happen during... I, I don't even think that would happen during starvation. Maybe. You usually die of other things during starvation, not hypoglycemia. It's a, that's a sugar issue. That, that's a spike sugar issue and then fall or, or something else like a poison or something. For example, say like in a clinical setting, I had a patient that was hypoglycemic. I don't want to wait for a complex carbohydrate. I want to get a simple sugar in there to raise the blood sugar. Well, yes, but once what I'm trying to say here, yeah, you need something fast. But the, the problem that I'm talking about here is why would someone have hypoglycemia? What was the thing that caused the hypoglycemia? Their levels up to get them out of that hypoglycemic state. Yeah, what? So that you can so that they can enter it again if you spike it? Maybe I'm a marathon runner. And I'm halfway through the marathon, my glucose levels are getting low. <laughs> no, they shouldn't be getting low. Gluconeogenesis. If you actually have the enzymes responsible for creating glucose endogenously to a significant degree, which you would if you weren't consuming carbs, your blood sugar regulation abilities are far, 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 far better than someone that consumes carbs all the time. Because not only would your enzymes that like uh, Pepsi-K and pyruvate carboxylase and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase be present in high amounts, so for gluconeogenesis, but also your enzymes involved in beta oxidation, fatty acid oxidation would be higher as well, which allows your body to actually run on fat more effectively. Not to mention the fact that when you're not consuming carbohydrates and your body is using fat and it's tapping into its own fat stores, you recycle about 75% of all of the triglycerides that you break down from your fat cells. If you didn't know that, that's located in a paper entitled Glyceronioneogenesis, a process that for some reason is not actually officially taught in biochemistry textbooks, but should be because it's the entire reason why we're able to subsist for five days, actually, in some cases. Mr. McDonald, Alec McDonald, McDonald, Alex McDonald, I believe, who ran one marathon every day for five days without consuming a bit of food. And he's a carnivore. It's the entire reason he was able to do that. So no, what you're going to do is you're going to say that you should be consuming glucose gels or something like that. And it's, it's not true. If you are someone that consumes carbohydrates regularly and you are in this situation, then yes, you should. But you shouldn't be this person. You should be consuming a species appropriate, species specific diet for your speciation. That being a 100% carnivore diet consisting primarily of the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals with added fat in the forms of butter, tallow, lard, suet, and ghee as desired with added salt to taste and water and consuming no plants or carbohydrates to speak of, transitioning appropriately and prudently over the course of six to eight weeks with each week increasing your intake of animal foods commensurate with the amount of plant food you are decreasing there you go i need to get an energy boost of glucose into my bloodstream it's okay so why are you pretending like fat isn't a source of energy or really a a a, a, sor a substrate that is used to create energy because it's not a source of energy there's no energy contained within fat don't say that there's energy contained within the bonds because there's no energy contained within the bonds the bonds when they're broken apart result in a creation of energy that is basically taken from the field so to speak it doesn't exist in mass as possible. Yes, the ideal situation is to have a balanced intake of carbohydrates or no it is not absolutely false sir a balanced supply of carbohydrates not an intake of them or blood glucose levels but gluconeogenesis look into that sir as you can see there are certain situations where it can be appropriate to get that glucose into the bloodstream as quickly as possible and yes in hypoglycemic events which what caused the hypoglycemia See, basically what you're saying is that glucose should be used as a drug, and it should be, because it is one. One thing I do want to mention is that in the clinical setting, if we have to get somebody's blood sugar levels up or during a marathon, it's not like we're giving people like spoonfuls of table sugar. There are certain mixtures or products that are made up of simple sugars or simple carbohydrates to get this done. But if you are in a pinch, a sugary drink or a sugary juice often will have the same effect. Yes, it will. And we have to go back to this idea that I mentioned or alluded to earlier, the glucose molecule in table sugar is the exact same structure and form as the glucose molecule that came from some fruit, vegetable, or other whole food source. You hear that, Paul Saladino? Do you hear that? It's the same molecule, isn't it? Yeah, there's actually no difference. Structurally, biochemically, biologically, chemically, whatever word you want to use, they all mean the same thing. And you know what? He's right, and I'm right, and you're wrong. It's not like the glucose molecule from the sugar is labeled as poison. It's not- No, but it should be. Like your body has this glucose segregating police force that says, you, glucose molecule that came from the sugar, you are banished to the fat cell. 
Exactly. They're all banished to the fat cell if present in excess in the bloodstream where the cells cannot utilize it for energy at the moment because it's present in excess. Okay. But you, glucose molecule that came from the whole grain food, you can go into the muscle cell. And yeah, no, it's actually in many cases still ushered to the fat cell. They're the same molecule, so therefore they will react the same way with the body, or th really the body will react to that molecule the same way, given the circumstances. Correct, but you're missing the point. You, the glucose molecule that came from the kale, you can... Glucose came from the kale? Did any come from the kale? Go into the nerve cell. No! Your body doesn't care or know the difference between where the glucose came from. You hear that, Paul? Glucose is glucose. You hear that, Paul? Ow. Even though I said glucose is glucose and that our body doesn't differentiate between the sources from where the glucose comes from, there are still some important considerations we have to have when it comes to sugar. Yeah, and I already laid those out, but let's see what you have to say. For example, sugar is often referred to as empty calories. Well, <sighs> This word calories needs to stop being used immediately. I really mean it. Immediately needs to stop being used. Stop saying that we consume something that has no mass and manifests itself as photons of light when manifested in the real world. Food does not contain calories. It's stupid. It's a proxy measure for attempting to convey how much energy you would yield from that food when you consume it, which also isn't true because you don't yield energy effectively from your food. You definitely don't yield it directly because if you did, well, E equals MC squared. You can use that equation to find out exactly how much energy was is contained within even the smallest bit of mass, which is an exorbitant amount. So you'd be effulgent every time you ate if you directly yielded energy from your food. What actually happens is the human body absorbs mass in the forms of fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and alcohol, chemically interacts those substances under control of molecular oxygen. They react in such a way so as to alter the positioning of the chemical bonds. And since those reactions are exothermic, some heat or calories or photons of light are released, 70% of which actually is to entropy because of the inefficiency of the human body, and 30% is actually encapsulated in the form of potential energy between ADP and PI to form ATP, which is the cellular energy currency or the molecular energy storage form, and then that energy is then released to power a biochemical pathway when indicated. Okay, the calories that are released are a proxy measure for how much energy is being used in the body, and it's a poor one at that because in reality, if you completely focus on calories, you have to acknowledge the fact that calories, or really hormones, have no effect on calories, they have an effect on mass. Where that mass mass actually goes and how the mass is utilized by the body is dependent on hormonal responses, inflammatory signaling pathways and presentations and activity level and yada, yada, yada. Okay. Hormones are responsible for most influentially determining how mass is utilized in the body. Okay. They're not dictators of fuel use per se, but they are the most influential at determining that. So there's no such thing as empty calories. Our calorie intake across the board necessarily at all times is zero. The human body body is an open thermodynamic system, meaning that the law of thermodynamics, the first one that is cited, and the heat equivalence principle of that law is not sufficiently applicable for human beings because we allow for the flow of energy in and out of the system, but also mass in and out of our bodies, like fecal matter and urine, which are not accounted for in the calories in, calories out model. So anyway, continue. Meaning that glucose and fructose is essentially all we get in the form of calories and energy from that sugar. You don't get calories or energy from your food, and I kind of already covered that, didn't I? Not kind of, I, I literally did. As opposed to getting that glucose and fructose from whole food sources. It's not food for human beings. In that case, that glucose and fructose is often going to be associated with other benefits with well, it's associated. No, it's not associated with other benefits. Okay. What do you mean associated with other benefits? You talking about science, like an actual scientific association? Because if that's the case, there are no studies to inform upon basically any cause and effect relationship that you want to put forth between an externality like food or a lifestyle behavior as it relates to any heart health outcome or disease process over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed. And that includes saying something like associated with benefits because benefits is a cause and effect claim. So then you have to establish that something is a benefit scientifically as opposed to it being simply a positive opinion as to whether it's a benefit or not. It's silly. Things like vitamins, Okay, see, that's what you mean. Vitamins and minerals, which are necessarily beneficial to the survival of an organism. They're conducive to effectuating that and, and perpetuating the survival of the organism. Well, even if that sugar is associated with all those things, well, guess what? Meat has all those vitamins and minerals, in many cases more than those fruits and, and vegetables that he's talking about. And also they're, they seem to be more bioavailable as well. And it's completely bereft of all of the glucose, the toxic sugar that is in these foods. So that's a plus. Fiber and other nutrients that can help bolster health and wellness. And building further- So what? off of this idea of empty
empty calories. If well, I already covered empty calories. I already covered the word calories in the first place. Calories are the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water around a closed thermodynamic system, also known as a bomb calorimeter by one degree Celsius. It's a measurement of kinetic activity, or the movement of the molecules within that water. That movement being caused by photons of a certain wavelength interacting with the surrounding water after being released from the rapid combustion of a food within said bomb calorimeter via a massive electrical current, thus causing rotations, vibrations, and translations. That is all they are, okay? Last I checked, we we don't combust food in our stomachs. We're not a steam engine, okay? If you had to pick the most negative thing when it comes to sugar, it's probably this. We can eat a ton of it without actually feeling that full. Oh, God. Has this man ever heard of glycation? Ever. What is diabetes, sir? What is diabetes? What is diabetes? No, that's not what's bad about it. That's one of the things that is not the primary thing even. I wouldn't even say it's the primary problem with it. Because guess what? If you try and overeat meat and fat, and let's say you actually overeat, somehow you were able to, the effect that would have on your body is far less deleterious than this stuff would be if you did the same thing with it. And when you think about it from the perspective of, say, like early human ancestors or hunter-gatherers, did they get carbohydrates and some simple sugars through ingesting fruits and vegetables. Very, very seldomly during fruit season with fruit that was extremely small compared to the fruit we have today and far more fibrous. And once again, occurring during one season of the year, that being late summer and early fall before winter. Huh, I wonder if that helped us gain a bunch of fat before winter as well. I don't know. Yes, of course. But. Yes, of course. But. Yeah, exactly. But. What is he going to say? I just gave the but here. Were they also creating these factories where they were developing refined table sugar to also add to the foods they were already eating? Well, this is also a true point because because they, they didn't. Yes, and we see your point. That's also true, yes. No, but we do. Think about maybe the last time you went to a restaurant. Maybe instead of ordering a water, you ordered a soda. And maybe you got two to three refills. And that extra sugar that was in that soda was ingested and probably didn't make you feel any more full than if you just had two to three glasses of water instead. Also, adding that sugar to foods that we already eat. Again, probably doesn't increase how full we feel, but increases the amount of carbohydrates and sugars and therefore calories that we ingest. You don't ingest calories, they have no mass. The human body doesn't absorb calories, it doesn't absorb photons of light. If that were the case, then we could sit out in the sun and gain a bunch of fat. Doesn't happen, okay? Photons have an effect on the electron transport chain, really. That's really all that they have an effect on, okay? On a day-to-day -day basis, again, depending on how much sugar that you ingest. And so, this whole idea, again, is we've changed the ratio and therefore the total amount of carbohydrates and sugars that we ingest. The sugar. Yep, and how much carbohydrate content did we really consume, ancestrally speaking? Also, given the entire four and a half million year existence of our species, if you include proto-humans that preceded our current speciation, that being Homo sapiens sapien, out of that entire four and a half million year period, how often were we consuming plants? To any significant degree, that's the caveat there. 13,000 years, roughly, when the agricultural revolution occurred. So take 13,000 and divide that by four and a half million. And then multiply that by 100 to get your percentage of the entire time that we have consumed plants in any significant amount. And where do carbohydrates really come from? Well, plants. Yes, they come from dairy. And guess how long we've been consuming dairy? The same amount of time, by the way. Interesting. I know, I feel like I um I may spark some controversy every time that I talk about dairy. Because I know that, you know, in the carnivore space, dairy is a good thing, right? Because it's, it's an animal product. But I always tell people to be wary about it. Be wary of dairy. That's written in my book, by the way. Contraindicated. But no, it, it's important to be wary of dairy because, well, we always talk about how the only way to overeat on basically fat and protein is by consuming it with something sweet or consuming it with carbohydrates like a starch or something or um, putting a bunch of cheese on it. That's one way. Also, once again, some most a lot of dairy products have sugar in them. Also, casein seems to disrupt people's digestion and seems to cause some inflammation. At least casein A1, which is the predominant casein protein found in dairy products, seems to cause people to bloat more easily. It has morphine in it effectively. It's not the most optimal. And once again, we've also been consuming it for just as long as we've been consuming plants. The only reason why it's far, far, far more indicated to be consuming is that its fatty acid and protein profile, depending on the dairy you get, is much more congruous with the stuff that we actually have been eating for millions of years. So our genes are more familiar with that type of stuff. But anyway, yes, we've upped our intake of carbohydrates significantly, as well as other things, by the way. Seed oils as well. So, but yeah, it's a problem. We've also lowered our intake of actual indicated foods for our physiology. In and of itself is not easy. Evil. 
It's the no. It is in and of itself a problem. It's not evil. Nothing's evil like that. That's not. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying it's evil. It is contraindicated to the extreme. Out that we're getting so easily included in our daily diet. So right. But what is the exact required amount of carbohydrates in the human diet? It's zero. If it can only induce harm, and the body creates all of the glucose it needs endogenously in a demand-driven process called gluconeogenesis, then you shouldn't be consuming glucose. There is a small minority of people that require some degree of glucose, and it's very small still. The amount that they need to consume is still really small. It's usually about 20 grams a day, 20 to 50 maybe, 50 max. And those are people with metabolic derangement as a result of eating plants or people that have liver damage or something, which makes sense because where is glucose created in the body? Hmm, the liver? Another thing that I think will be helpful is for us to understand what happens as the glucose circulates throughout the body and what happens if there's too much. Huh, is he gonna talk about glycation? Now we already know that the glucose will first go to the liver and any fructose that's in there will just get converted to glucose anyway. But it's converted to fat, sir. Also, if you look at, well, the effects on, this is an interesting note, if you look at the effects on mice, yes, I know, it's just a little cherry on top here though. If you look at the effect on the genes in mice in response to a high carbohydrate and fat diet, so mixed meal diet, you see that actually glucose consumption to that significant of a degree and for that significant of a time period is, well, associated heavily with changes in genes that are responsible for converting glucose and using glucose glucose to convert into fat as opposed to using it to create energy. It actually will change. It's partly mediated by insulin, of course. What a shock with changes in the genes towards a fat creation and storing mode as opposed to a glucose utilization mode. It absolutely changes the genes. So interesting note. The liver will also start to store the glucose in its storage form, which is called glycogen. Yes, you store that in your muscles and your liver. Skeletal muscles is what I should say. I believe maybe the heart, I know that the heart can perform glycogenolysis, which means it must have, yeah, it must have glycogen stored within it. Is that, hold on a minute. That's an interesting point. Let's go ahead and ask ChatGPT. Does the heart perform glycogenolysis? Hmm. The heart itself does not perform glycogenolysis to a significant extent under normal conditions. Glycogenolysis is the process of breaking down glycogen and glucose, which primarily occurs in the liver and skeletal muscles. These organs store larger amounts of glycogen and use glycogenolysis regularly. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so yes, I was correct. It does, just not to any significant extent, which is exactly what I thought because, well, the heart primarily relies on fatty acids. That's interesting. And also it starts to rely more on ketones during heart failure as well, just if you're curious glycogen. And the liver can store about 100 grams of glycogen. And the rest of the glucose that isn't stored in the liver will circulate throughout the body. And yes, insulin is going to be released by the pancreas in response to these increasing blood sugar levels. And we're going to do also two other things that you are consuming alongside it. Protein has an effect on the beta cells as well. And so do long chain fatty acids and even your vagus nerve, you know, your own neurology can have effect on insulin, which is why even without consuming or tasting anything, if you smell something that tastes good, it'll start to release your insulin as well. So a whole video series on insulin and diabetes. So oh, good. I can't wait to hear about that one. Goodness. Tell me if you want to watch that, folks. For now, just know that- Or you want me to watch that, sorry. Insulin essentially tells the majority of the cells in your body to take the glucose from the bloodstream and into themselves, therefore lowering blood glucose or blood sugar levels. Yeah, and that's a vast oversimplification, and I understand why you're oversimplifying it, but yes, it's actually dependent on the I to G ratio, whether that will actually predominate or not. Insulin to glucagon, it's dependent on many different things. But yes, for the most part, yes, but the thing is, is insulin is also involved in upregulating certain enzymes that are responsible for synthesizing triglycerides, the storage form of fats, so fat thus to be stored, and also synthesizing fatty acids from glucose. We say from glucose, it's not from glucose. I don't really like that we say that. I say it, and I'm guilty of it. It's not from glucose glucose directly. That's not possible. It's from malonyl CoA, which glucose is most conducive to creating because, well, glucose and insulin's effects on the genes make it to where acetyl-CoA carboxylase is much more upregulated, and that's the enzyme that's responsible for taking acetyl-CoA and turning it into malonyl CoA, thus to form fatty acids. Gosh, I, I really try and simplify things, and then I start talking, and it's just it just goes right off the rails, doesn't it? Biochemistry is complicated. And if we take a look at skeletal muscle in particular, that glucose that gets pulled into the skeletal muscle tissue will also get stored as glycogen. Yes, in fact, that is the first thing that happens, just like he's saying right here. And the skeletal muscles throughout your body could store about 400 to 500 grams of glycogen, depending on who you are. So correct. Kind of think of the liver and the skeletal muscle tissue as little gas tanks for glucose and glycogen. But 
your muscles can also store triglycerides in them. It has a capacity to take glucose and turn it into fatty acids and then store triglycerides, interestingly enough. You do have stores of intramuscular fat. What happens when we've completely filled up the liver, completely filled up the skeletal muscle tissue, and there's still more glucose in the bloodstream? That's when we start seeing the glucose getting converted to fat. No, that's when you see the glucose starting to damage the tissues of your body. Yes, it's also being used to store fat. Why is it being ushered to the liver to be converted into fat so quickly? Perhaps to, I don't know, attempt to curtail the damage that it's inducing in the bloodstream to the epithelial cells, the cells that line the arteries and to a lesser extent the veins, and your red blood cells? Because that doesn't just happen in diabetes, that happens when you spike your glucose. But yes, it will be ushered to the liver to be converted into fat. And insulin is the hormone that is the one that upregulates glucose's transmutation into fatty acids, and also upregulates the enzymes responsible for taking those fatty acids and esterifying them to a glycerol molecule to form a triglyceride, thus to be stored into adipocytes or directly at the liver. Adipocytes also, you say that it's ushered to the liver, it's also ushered to adipocytes to convert the glucose into fat, until it's stored so much fat that you maximize the fatty acid, or the the triglyceride stores in the fat cells and then you need even more insulin to keep it in there and hyperplasia of the fat cells occurs and you get more fat cells and it's just this whole everything ties back to glucose it's this whole convoluted issue in the body everything ties directly back to glucose I'm getting stored in the adipose tissue and that's where we can and the liver start to run into problems by really increasing our glucose or our sugar intake beyond the capacity of say like our liver and our skeletal muscle tissue. So hopefully that gives you a different perspective or a better understanding of how sugar can be bad. So consistently- It is contraindicated. Exogenous carbohydrates are contraindicated in the extreme no matter what form they come in. Ingesting too much of it and having increased- Too much of it is any more than zero grams because there are no required carbohydrates to be consumed in the human diet. It's blood glucose levels and that excess blood glucose getting stored as fat and increasing weight over time. Yes, weight in the form of fat, correct, and it's in part mediated by insulin. And the associations of increased adipose with things like diabetes. Increased adiposity is not the cause of diabetes, it's associated with it. The cause of diabetes, type 2, is carbohydrate consumption. Cardiovascular disease and other conditions. Cardiovascular disease is ostensibly caused by chronic and systemic inflammation. It's absolutely caused by chronic hypertension, but you must target what the cause of the chronic hypertension is, and that is what is ostensibly chronic and systemic inflammation. The absolute cause of heart disease is the hypertension hypertension. It's just not the underpinning cause because no one's going to exhibit chronic hypertension without a stimulus. But finally, how does exercise influence or even change how we process sugar or glucose? Well, the muscles use glycogenolysis, which requires glycogen polymers to be built up, which are, well, synthesized from individual glucose molecules. So what happens is every single time that you twitch a muscle fiber, the myosin heads attach to actin filaments and cause the sliding filament model to basically be activated. And that muscle fiber, in order to actually get the ATP required to power the myosin head contraction there, basically breaks down glycogen via glycogen phosphorylase and other stuff, debranching enzyme and all that stuff, releasing, well, a ton of ATP with a bunch of pyruvate being left over, which since there's so much pyruvate left over, so much that the mitochondria actually cannot oxidize all of it at that given instance in time, most of the pyruvate is actually converted into lactate in order to maintain the pH balance of the cell. Lactate migrates to the bloodstream, goes to the liver to be converted back into glucose, and then is recycled. It's called the Cori cycle. That's how glucose is involved in exercise. During intense exercise, there's a gear shift over from fatty acid oxidation and ketone metabolism over to glucose oxidation. When you get into an intense enough exercise, or you, you exercise for long enough at a high enough intensity, the mitochondria within the muscle cells will also start to use glucose. So this will also help with getting blood glucose levels down. So what? Does that mean that you should be consuming the glucose to power that? No. That doesn't mean that at all, actually. Also, here's the other thing. If you were depending on exogenous glucose for your fuel before an exercise, you get a surge of energy, but then you'll have a crash. You will absolutely have a crash. Moderate to intense activity causes the skeletal muscles to preferentially shift their source of energy to burning more carbohydrates, more so than fats. Over time. But you can actually, during an exercise, you absolutely can have mitochondria within the muscle cells oxidizing fatty acids and ketones. But anyway, yes, that has to do with AMPK activity as well. And in insulin and, well, calcium. That was the other one I was looking for. Calcium ions will have an effect on that. Well, it'll have an effect on PDH. Also, as someone increases their activity or consistently exercises, their ability to store glycogen in their skeletal muscles 
increases. So th yes, glycogen concentration within muscle cells and the liver, but primarily muscle cells, is dependent on activity level and frequency, not on diet. So if it's high intensity resistance training, physical training like that, you will increase the amount of glycogen that you can store in your muscles, which can help basically function as tanks for glucose, so to speak, basins. Still doesn't mean that you should be consuming the glucose. Think of your skeletal muscle gas tank for glycogen getting bigger so you can store more glycogen. And if you compared that to a sedentary or an inactive person with that of an active person, those who are inactive, you'd see that their resting glycogen stores are about 20 to 30% less than the active person. True. I don't know if that's the exact number, but who cares? So in theory, someone who's consistently active could eat more carbohydrates, not only because they're just burning more calories on a day to day. But you don't burn something that is a result of burning something. False. You don't burn calories. You also don't burn substrate. You oxidize substrate. So no, they're not burning more calories. They're using more substrate to create energy and releasing more calories as a byproduct of metabolism, which given the fact that they contain no mass, do not affect the mass balance of the body up or down. Okay. Basis, but also because they have the ability to store more of it in their skeletal muscle. Yes, but just because they have the ability to store more of it does not mean they should be consuming more carbohydrates. Before it'll start getting converted to fat. Exercise also sensitizes muscles to insulin, especially directly after exercise. Well, yes, but that has to do with AMPK, mostly. AMP activated protein kinase is a protein kinase that is activated by AMP, adenosine monophosphate. So everyone heard, everyone knows about ATP and ADP. AMP is one phosphate. During exercise, since the energy demands are so high, a cell will be drained of ATP relatively quickly. And in order to produce ATP quickly enough to prevent the lag, that would occur otherwise, the cell can take two ADP molecules and react them together to form ATP and AMP. Enough AMP builds up, it will stimulate the activity of that, which will recruit GLUT4 transporters to the plasma membrane for glucose uptake, anyway. And this is kind of the opposite of what happens during type 2 diabetes. Generally, we say with type 2 diabetes, that the majority of cells throughout the body become insensitive to insulin. But well, it's not that they're insensitive to it. It's not what's happening. In fat cells, different story, I guess, because it's not that they're even becoming insensitive. It's that they don't have the capacity to store any more fat. They don't have the capacity to store any more fat. In muscle cells, this is completely different. Insulin resistance is not one thing. It is multiple things. There's a Randall cycle situation that's occurring. There's also, that, that's at the level of the muscle. There's also, at the level of fat cells, the Randall cycle situation can also occur, but maximum hypertrophy can occur as well. I think I may have said publicly otherwise, I was wrong. Because that's what causes the fat cells to become inflamed and then release adipokines or, or lipokines. So anyway, and that also causes them, if they get big enough, they can function as a false endocrine organ and all that stuff, releasing hormones that just fuck up everything, so. Exercise has this sensitizing effect, especially with the skeletal muscles. Right, and it's funny because metformin has the same effect for the same reason, actually. It will stimulate AMPK. Exercise does the same thing. Hmm. And speaking of insulin, something that's really cool with exercise is that an exercising muscle doesn't actually need insulin to bring in the glucose like a resting muscle does. So well, it has GLUT1 transporters. So yeah, so the reason it has GLUT1 transporters, which are glucose dependent, so they can actually increase the uptake of glucose without insulin's presence. However, the GLUT4 membranes or transporters that are translocated to the plasma membrane are insulin dependent. So no, you do require insulin during a workout. I believe that you see insulin rise during a workout. You definitely see glucose rise, but that's obvious. But I'm pretty sure you see not necessarily a commensurate increase in insulin. That can't happen, but an increase. Say you're running a marathon or exercising and you ingest like a simple sugar or a carbohydrate to replenish your carbohydrate stores. Don't do that. Those contracting muscles can bring in the glucose without the need for insulin. So obviously you- Well, but they also need insulin for the other transporters that are insulin dependent. There's GLUT1 and then there's GLUT4. During exercise, you have more of a recruitment of GLUT4 transporters to the plasma membrane, which means that cell will be responding to more insulin. I mean, over 80% of glucose utilization in the body actually comes from GLUT1. It doesn't come from GLUT4. That's basal mainly though. You can see there are some amazing benefits to exercise through how it helps us to process and utilize those sugars or that glucose. And again, hold correct, but it doesn't mean you should be consuming it. Gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. That, hey guys, this is my profession. This is my job now. I get to sit on camera or sit in front of a camera and I get to go gluconeogenesis. Thank you very much. And then applause, everything like that. It's like, thanks, I got paid for that. Like what, really? Come on, gluconeogenesis.
hopefully all of this helped to just clarify how and when sugar can be bad. And if sugar is contraindicated, exogenously speaking, in every single circumstance, no matter what, unless, like you just said, you're exhibiting extreme hypoglycemia from something that's oftentimes a sugar-related disorder, meaning related to sugar consumption or something, or poisoning, so not, this is anomalous, or if you are in the middle of the woods, surrounded by nothing but an apple, and you're going to starve to death. There you go, eat the, eat the apple, go ahead. Of course, if you made me pick between the two extremes, say I had someone that didn't eat any processed sugar and only got their carbohydrates from whole food sources versus someone who ate a ton of sugar. Obviously, we're going to pick the situation where we get our carbohydrates only from the whole food sources. Or no, you're going to pick neither because you're sensible. But most of us don't live on those two extremes. And as long as the majority of your... Did he seriously call that an extreme? Getting your carbohydrates from whole food sources? That's extreme? but most of us don't live on those two extremes. Yeah, and most of us are sick and dying. And as long as the majority of your carbohydrates come from whole food sources and you have this balanced ratio of carbohydrates to lipids to proteins. Nope, the balanced diet is completely contraindicated. It's actually arguably worse than a vegan diet. That is a completely unnatural meal to be consuming. You do not have a mixed meal of fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Fat and carbohydrates are the primary fuel sources for mitochondria. You consume both of them. You just give the body mixed signals everywhere. It's like jamming. It, it, you have gear jamming and grinding occurring, analogously speaking. It's not good. Randall's cycle. You're likely gonna be just fine with indulging into your favorite sugar retreat every so often. And oh God. So perpetuating sugar addiction, perpetuating sugar consumption and processed food consumption, everything in moderation, bro, dude. Yeah, next time I find an alcoholic and see an alcoholic, I'll tell them to moderate their alcohol intake. As long as you're just doing it in moderation. How about you recognize the fact that alcohol is not required for human consumption and it's toxic above a physiological level, more toxic than glucose to be fair, but either way, and therefore you shouldn't consume it at all and it's an addiction if you wanna consume it still. Remember, one of the best times to do that is directly after exercise, when those skeletal muscles are sensitized to bring in that glucose to replenish the glycogen stores. There is no time that is good to do such a thing or indicated to do such a thing. If we wanna play devil's advocate here, that probably is the best time to consume glucose, but who cares? The best time to perpetuate your addiction is after exercise. Well, is there really a good time to perpetuate your addiction? And FYI, it's also a good time to add protein to that because your skeletal muscles are primed to also bring in those amino acids or those proteins to help the rebuilding process. It's the only true thing you said during this entire video. Good job. And as always, thank you for watching everyone. We really do appreciate- You're welcome. Everyone's support in making this channel possible. If you're interested in- Stick to anatomy, please, because you have really good videos on anatomy and I really appreciate those, but not this. This is not good. Checking out AG1. Again, that link is- in I'm not gonna check that out. We already, we already covered AG1. In the description below. And if you feel the need, like, subscribe, leave some- Unfortunately, I'm not going to like this video. I've liked many of your others. I'm not going to do that. I'm not subscribed to you either. Comments below, and we'll see you in the next video. Well, maybe. That depends on what my viewers say in response to this video. Okay, so that was um, interesting to say the least. I hope that you guys learned some things. I try to, you know, a lot of times these videos are really simple, like uh, don't eat carbs, gluconeogenesis, blah, blah, the same old stuff. So I try to, you know, put some more information in. So I hope that you guys actually like that. A lot of people are turned off by it as well though, because it's too technical. I try and please every crowd and it's it's impossible to do that. So anyway, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video nevertheless. Please, if you did, leave a like, subscribe to the channel, leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and also subscribe to the Patreon once again, if you haven't already, and buy my book Contra indicated again if you haven't already and also most importantly the link on the bottom of the screen what is that link well that is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as cerule if you purchase product through that link you will get a permanent 10 percent discount and permanent free shipping on all of your orders when signing up for monthly deliveries but of course i don't want you to pay for those products so if you want you can email me behind the scenes at edgoki14 at gmail.com and ask me how to earn those products for free because who in the right mind wouldn't want that but of course before buying those products i would recommend learning about what those products do in the first place. So I would recommend referring to the link at the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products link, which is a complete video elucidation and explanation of what those products are, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc., etc. And I would also further migrate to the description below to find an interview between myself and Professor Barquet on these products in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself, which I think is extremely important when you are considering where your money is going. If you are someone that would not like to contribute a monthly recurring payment, I have an option available for you in the description, that being a GoFundMe link for one-time donations that
that you can contribute, which would be greatly appreciated. And also, finally, email me at gookie14 at gmail.com once again about any questions you may have. So, with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else that thinks that they know about biochemistry and nutrition when they know about anatomy instead, for some reason. So, till then.